here they come. Oh, we got one that's real slow coming down there. I wonder who this could be. <laughs> Come on up here, sweetheart. That's it. This one I think I know personally. Come on. Here we go. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you all doing today? Good. It's so good to see all of you. Man, you guys are dressed up so nicely. That's so nice to see. Now, how many of you are in Ignite? Are you guys, do you guys come on Wednesday nights? Most of you come on Wednesday nights? That's good. We're going to be Christmas caroling in a couple weeks, so we will plan on that, right? All right. Be sure to bring your families with because you know what? I'd like to have 200 people out Christmas caroling. Sounds like a lot of people, doesn't it? But wouldn't that be fun to have a big party that night? I think so, too. And most of all, we get to share that party with people who can't get out very much. And that's a really good thing. Well, I got something here today, uh, and I, I wanted to show it to you. When you're outside all day, or you've been out at school, and you come home afterwards, and it's maybe time to... Uh, eat supper with your family, Does, do your parents ever say, oh, it's time to wash your hands first? Have you heard this before? Some of you say yes, some of you say no. I know in my house I hear it all the time. Be sure to wash your hands before you eat. Why? Well, because I've been outside all day. And my hands got dirty. Got all kinds of junk on them. Some of those things you can see but some of them you can't. They're sort of like they're invisible, but they're all there. We know that. And so, yes, sir. They're tiny. They're, tiny. they're so tiny you can't see them, but they're there, aren't they? Even though, they're, even though we can't see them sometimes. And so what do we do? We grab a little soap, or in this case, we have a little disinfectant for you, right? And we rub our hands together, right? And, it them and then it, it, it washes them off, but even better than that, it kind of destroys them. It gets rid of them all together. You know, I thought about that as I thought about what we do here at church. And we are out in the world all week. And not our hands, but our hearts sometimes kind of get dirty with something called sin. All right? And so we come to church, and that's the reason we come to church, to get our hearts washed. But we don't wash with soap, and we don't wash with disinfectant. It's called hand sanitizer. We wash with something else. Does anybody know what it is? I'll bet you don't know. What do you think? Oh, that's good. He does know. Jesus' word. We wash with Jesus' word. And God's word as well. And God's word is a word of forgiveness. So we have sin in our hearts. And we come here, and we wash our hearts with God's word, Jesus' word. And he says, I forgive you your sin. And guess what? Those sins, some of them we can see because they're like dirty hands. Some of those things we can see. Some of them we can't see. They're all taken away. Isn't that cool? So when you come here today, that's what we're doing, washing our hearts. Now, See these two ladies right over here, sitting in the front row? Wave at us, ladies. Wave back, guys. I think they got children's church for you, so if you want to go with them, you may. Thanks much. Would you all please stand? And our washing has already begun in the brief order of confession and forgiveness and continues now with the Kyrie. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. be with you. Let us all pray. Stir up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give to all people of the world knowledge of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated, everyone. Good morning. This is the uh, second Sunday of Advent, December 6th. Our first lesson is Malachi 3, 1 through 4. The Lord announces a covenant with Israel. A messenger like Malachi, his name means my messenger, shall prepare the way for the coming of the Lord by purifying and refining God's people as silver and gold are refined. 
I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be accepted to the Lord as in the days gone by, as in the former years. The second lesson is Luke 1, 68 to 79. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. As he said through his prophets, through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. A gospel lesson for the second Sunday of Advent is from the third chapter of the gospel according to St. Luke. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iterea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. Here ends the reading of the gospel lesson for the day. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. On one early winter evening, back before the fall of the Soviet Union, a Russian couple was walking along the streets of St. Petersburg when the man, Yuri, felt a few drops of precipitation hit his nose. Yuri turned to his wife and said, Olga, it's begun to rain. No, Yuri, she replied, that was snow. Olga, Yuri said, you're wrong. I'm sure it was just rain. No, Yuri, I can tell snow. This is snow. And that, as they say, is when the argument started. However, they hadn't gotten too far into it before they saw their local Communist Party official walking toward them down the street. Yuri, being the good communist that he was, said, let's not fight about this, Olga. Let's ask Comrade Rudolph here to get the official party word as to whether it is raining or snowing. 
So as the man approached, Yuri greeted him. Good evening, Comrade Rudolph. Tell us, please, officially speaking from the party, is it raining tonight or is it snowing? Well, Comrade Rudolph glared at them in the way that only petty Communist Party officials can glare. And he shot back to them, it's raining, of course. And he stomped off like the self-important little man that he was. But <laughs> Olga wasn't satisfied. Once she made sure that Comrade Rudolph was safely out of earshot, she said, I don't care what the local party official line is. I f that felt like snow. It's snowing to which her husband replied, Olga, now simply resign yourself to the fact that it's raining. After all, Rudolph the Red knows rain, dear. Ooh, hostility. Some people just don't like good humor. <laughs> I knew Lauren would like it. Uh, and it's an oldie but a goodie. Indeed, a fellow member of, our, our, of the clergy brought that one to text study this past week, someone who I can assure you is younger than that joke is. But as I got to thinking over the gospel text for this past week, it occurred to me that that, that stupid joke does actually connect with this text. You're going to wonder about that. You see, Luke, at this point in his gospel, at the end of chapter 2, at the very beginning of chapter 3, has just wrapped up not only his version of the Christmas story in Luke 2, but also the story of Joseph and Mary bringing Jesus to the temple when he was 12 years old. And if you, re you remember that story, I'm sure he was fascinated by the temple and the people in it, and, and he spent all of his time questioning the learned teachers of the law there. And... He spent so much time there that um, Mary and Joseph inadvertently left him behind in Jerusalem when they started off for home thinking that he was traveling with some of their friends and relatives. And they had to turn around and come back and get him. That was in chapter 2. Now at the beginning of chapter 3, Luke is just starting to tell the story of Jesus' public ministry when Jesus was an adult. And he begins with the part that John the Baptist plays in all of this. But it's interesting, inst Luke, instead of starting off by recalling John's ringing call to repentance, or but with any other religiously significant happening for that matter, Luke instead gives us a detailed list of imperial Roman and local Jewish authorities almost as if he were appealing to the authority of the local government rulers and officials to somehow validate the actions and the, the ministry of Jesus in much the same way that our Russian friend Yuri appealed to the, local, to the authority of his local Communist Party official as to whether it was raining or snowing. That's what it almost looks like. You know, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, various tetrarchs and so forth, but that's not what's going on. What Luke is really doing is drawing a contrast here, a contrast between human kingdoms and human authority and the reign of God and God's authority. Part of Luke's point is that the authority that Tiberius or Herod or any of the other tetrarchs or the high priest, any of the authorities that, that they might have claimed for themselves, they were not the ultimate claim. They were not the ultimate authority. That ultimate authority is something that belongs to God alone. Which in turn, that means, in turn means that we, the people of God, do not owe our highest allegiance to any sort of earthly authority, although such authorities certainly have their place. Rather, we owe our highest allegiance to God. Indeed, it was not any worldly authority that motivated John the Baptist in what he said or did. It was God's word that set his ministry into motion. And what's more, this word of God had commissioned John to prepare the way not for another Caesar or governor or tetrarch or whatever. As the prophet points out, as the prophet Isaiah points out, I should say, 
John was to prepare the way of the one true Lord. So, that's what he set about doing. The words from Isaiah that Luke quotes here give us a rather uh, a curious image of what John was supposed to do. He's to instruct people to prepare for the Lord's approach by doing things like filling in valleys and leveling off mountains and hills and straightening what is crooked and smoothing out what is rough. Sounds more like a highway construction job than anything else, doesn't it? It makes it sound as though we're going to need bulldozers and earth-moving equipment, along with the occasional blast of dynamite, more than any sort of pious spiritual religious exercise, such as prayer or fasting or the singing of psalms. But maybe that's part of John's point. While prayer and confession and hymn singing certainly have their place, even a primary place in our lives, Sometimes the situation calls for something other than that. Or perhaps better said, these, these elements are only the start of what's sometimes necessary. Sometimes action beyond these religious exercises is needed because when we're preparing for the coming of Jesus, it's vital that we do whatever we need to do to clear any and all obstacles from his path as he comes to us. In other words, we don't only need to pray about what stands between us and God. We don't only need to confess our failures and shortcomings. We also need then to follow up with actively making changes in our lives that will root out those obstacles so that they don't come back again. True enough, there will always be obstacles. No one is perfect and we're not working our way toward perfection. At the same time, it makes no sense to remain wallowing in some of in the same familiar sins and expect that our relationship with God is going to get any better. What I mean is that sometimes those obstacles that Luke talks about here are, are not simply sins of ours, but they're, they're sins that we stubbornly cling to. Maybe Jesus is trying to do something new or remarkable in our lives, but some favorite sin of ours keeps getting in the way. A sin we might even recognize as a sin, but it's something that we kind of like and we don't really want to part with. Just to give an example, um, not too long ago, I, I came across a challenge we, um, for which a person is not to complain or say anything negative or critical for one day. Not to badmouth anyone, not to whine about anything, not to gripe about how tough life can be, and to go 24, just 24 hours without doing any of that. I'm ashamed to say that I found it really hard to do. What's more, I'm also ashamed to say that I find it really easy to slide back into that habit of being complaining and critical. Not only that, there were times, there are times, when, I, when I'm standing there knowing that, you know, I really should try not to be critical and complaining. But you know, something has really irritated me. And I want to be critical and complaining anyway. And I stand there knowing I shouldn't do it, and I give in anyway. And I, you know, even in mid-rant, I know I should just shut up and stop. But I don't. And afterwards, I'm ashamed of myself and feel like a failure. My point here being that the things such as an uncontrolled tongue can be an obstacle to Jesus being as active in your life as he would like to be. I mean, it's, it's hard to be understanding and compassionate and loving towards someone when you're standing there being judgmental and, and being critical and finding fault. And Jesus wants to be active in your life, to show you love and mercy, to strengthen your faith, and to bring light and hope into places of hurt and despair. 
Just as Jesus challenged the existing political and religious authority when he came 2,000 years ago, Jesus challenges us when he comes to us today. He challenges our assumptions, our ways of doing things, and indeed our sins. But he challenges us to repent, which means to not simply to say I'm sorry, but to make changes in our lives, to turn from our old ways of doing things and to follow his ways. For it is in pushing aside any and all impediments that we prepare the way of the Lord into our lives. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let us confess our faith together now in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all according to their needs. Heavenly Father, there is uh, so much on our hearts this week. We have experienced, uh, again, another act of violence and terrorism. We pray for those, Lord, who are victims and the families of those victims. We ask, Lord, that you would bring them a measure of solace and peace, each according to their needs, that you would come into their lives with the hope and promise of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for our enemies, Lord, that they would know the error of their ways, that they would come to you. Lord, in your mercy, we pray, Lord, for this world that is a boil. We pray that you would bring peace, that you would bring life, that you would bring harmony and hope. Lord, in your mercy, we pray, Lord, for those among us who are coming into the Christmas season alone and some of them for the first time. We ask, Lord, that you would walk with them, that you would be their guide and their shepherd and their stay. Lord, in your mercy, for these and all things we come to you in prayer, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.